Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of DIY MMO where I make an MMO on YouTube by myself because fuck you I won't do what you tell me is a thing that Rage Against the Machine once sang in a song. Oh uh, so another little format change. You may notice know this if I if you uh, watch uh, Train of Thought, which you should, because I hear it's very entertaining. I wouldn't know. I just get distracted playing with trains. Yeah, I decided to to do a little bit less on screen coding and a little bit more explaining of concepts. So last time we did a thing. Let's uh, let's show you the thing that we did. Let's just ignore the whole mouse position thing for now. So the, these uh, these grass tiles, um, they're, they're just automatically drawn with the right fringe or edge um, graphic. And I realized that while I did explain it, I don't think I really did the concept much justice. So what I'm going to be doing from now on, and please do tell me if you prefer or this format or the old one, is a little bit more. Why is there a smudge on my screen? That's annoying. That's oh oh dear. Oh my god, this is like no. Okay, a um, little bit more explaining of concepts, a little bit less live coding. That might also mean shorter episodes. Who knows? Um, but we're gonna start with this one. So what happens is if you have a grass tile, so if a tile is set to have grass on it, the map will start looking at the four neighbors above, below, left and right to see what kind of grass tile it needs to do. Now, the way you do this is by assigning every neighbor a number. Like if like um, one is left, then right is two, then four is below and eight is top. Now, if you if you add eight, four, two, and one, that's fifteen. So that means if you have all neighbors, you get a full tile, like like this one. Um, this is a, is a is a bit wise thing. So a number in let's just do do a four bit number. So you have four bits, and they, these can all be one. Now the way that numbers in a computer work is every bit is a multiple is a, is a power of two so the first bit is two to the power zero does is that correct let's let's just see if that is correct two to the power zero yes okay so two to the power zero is one and then two to the power two to the power one is two and two to the power two is Four. So, so this is two times zero is one. Okay, that doesn't make sense. But two times blah is one. I don't understand how to better explain that. Just two is two. Two times two is four. Two to the power three is eight. So that's two times two times two. So that's four times two is eight. And then two times. Well, this actually in our four bit number we don't even have we don't even have two to the power four. So this is what each bit represents. So this bit is one if it's on or zero. This bit is two if it's on or zero. This is four if it's on or zero, and this is eight. So if all of them are on, then you just you just add the bits for any given number. So everything is off is like zero plus zero plus zero is zero, obviously. So if you have it all on, then it's one times two times one plus two plus four plus eight. And that's 15. So you can see if all none of the bits are on, it's zero, and all of the bits are on, it's 15. That's 16 numbers that we can represent, which is true because if you do, um, is it two to the power of four? That's how many bits there are in a number. That's 16, which is how many combinations a four-bit number has. If we do a random like this, then. The first bit is on, so that's one, and this is either zero or two. It's off, so it's zero. This is four or zero, so this is on, so it's four. And then it's zero again, so this is five. 
So that's how bitwise the numbers work. And we're using a little trick here by using assigning a bitwise number to every neighbor we can add all these numbers together and mathematically determine which tile we need so you see if if it's zero that means it doesn't have any neighbors so up here is zero one two three this is what you add to the number that's on the row here so this is zero plus zero is Zero is um, four plus zero is four, four plus one is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So this is this has no neighbors, so you don't add any numbers, so it's just zero. So that makes sense. Now left is one. So if you take this and you're like, yeah, but now it has a left neighbor, so you want to extend it to the left. Okay, that makes sense. Now, two is that it has a neighbor to the right. So, okay, it has a neighbor to the right. Now, three is two plus one. So that means if, if you have a neighbor to the left, you get one. And then you're like, oh, it also has a neighbor to the right. So it's plus two. So then you wind up with three. And then uh, so on and so forth. Now, the interesting part here is, look how this works. This row is just this row except the bottom is active because you're adding four to all of these these are the same number as these like the lower two bits one and two make these four numbers are you are you getting this hang on let me let me put this in in notepad so you have so you have these two bits is for the top row so you can have zero you can have one you know, two and three because it's like zero plus zero, one plus zero, zero plus two, and one plus two. So that's zero, one, two, and three. And then if you add this bit, then it's the same thing for, for these bits, except always adding four. Oops, that is not what I wanted to do at all. And now everything has gone tits up. But that's fine. Now this row is, if if you ignore the bottom, it's actually the same. So this one has no neighbors. This one has no left, top, and right neighbors. This one has a left neighbor. This one has a left neighbor. This one has a right neighbor. This one has a right neighbor. This one has left and right neighbors. But all of these have a bottom neighbor because bottom is plus four. Now again, the row b beneath that is the same as this, except with top neighbors. So it's the same as before with top. And then this is the same as this, plus a top and a bottom neighbor. So this has nothing, but if you have a top and a bottom neighbor, then you add four and eight and you get 12. This is one, but if you also have a top and a bottom neighbor, then you add 12, which is 13, etc. So that's how that works. It's a very convenient trick. You can use this for a lot of things. I use this in Midboss to um, determine valid placement of decoration so it wouldn't block. I had a 3x3 three three, uh, matrix. So I had... Um, so I had like this. And then the middle tile I already knew was something. So let's just... So that's eight. So then you have an 8-bit number, which is 256 combinations. Obviously, I didn't do that one by hand. I calculated it algorithmically. But then I wound up with a set of 256 numbers, some of which were valid positions and some of which weren't, which made it really quick and easy and fast to calculate where I, when I could place a decoration without blocking the player's path, which is interesting. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, that actually took a lot longer to explain than I thought. Now, this, the, the, ignore you saw that. So we have this now. We, we know which tile, like you can see here, it says which tile your mouse is over. And um, see, it goes behind there. And that's, that's all very, very well and good. Um, and... 
This is convenient because I want to add walking to the game. And if you don't know where you're clicking, then that's going to be a bit of a pickle. Now, the way I do this is I'm first going to show you the code and then I'm going to explain the concept. So let's go all the way down here. This is our rendering code. It's the same as it was last time, mostly. So let's just put a, a, a thing there. So we added uh, to, to the render call. So let's go there then. I am going to walk you through all this call, the code. We added a render call back. So this is a delegate and it takes a rectangle and a depth from the render call. So the render call is like, okay, you can spec specify a delegate. If you specify a delegate, like a callback, when you render a thing, then it's gonna check, okay, did you specify one? Okay. And then it's gonna um, call that function with the on-screen rectangle where your image is going to be drawn and the depth of the image. Now I'm using depth for, for sorting all the tiles automatically because they can be drawn in any order. That's important for me because it's an optimization thing. You can also just draw back to front and top to bottom and that will also work and then you don't need to do that. But that's completely neither here nor there. Okay, so it gives you the on-screen rectangle and now this, this notation, I will just tell you this if you're not aware. So that's a lambda, a lambda function. So this is like an inline function, as if in JavaScript you can do like, uh, you can do an anonymous function. So you just, you assign this and then you can do that. You can call it. In, this is basically the same thing in C sharp. So, so if I do like A B C, return D, and this is a lambda, then you could see that as as having like a function int do stuff int A int int B int C. Oh, wait, that doesn't make sense, return D. So I, know, A plus B minus C, there. Return A plus B minus C. Now, so this is the same as this. If, if it, this says, if you call this with A, B and C, then it's gonna return A pl plus B minus C, which is the same that this does. The thing is because you can do this at runtime, you can also do like, instead of doing C, so we already know that C is that. And then you can remove this. And this will still work because this is called a closure. It'll store the value of C with this um, on the fly function as it were. And that'll work. It's kind of the same as if you had like a, a member variable in your class that was that was C and you, you remove this argument. So it's kind of like that. So this is just, just a function. Um, so you see that as the callback, we want it to call a function that we just made up that takes the rectangle and the depth and then calls mouse over tile with this tile that we just got, that's that's the image, and um, that's actually dumb. This should probably give you the tile as well. Yeah, that's a that's a thing I should do. Okay, so let's do that. I uh, renderable renderable. Um. Or just call it image, I guess. And I'm still doing on screen code, and this episode is still getting very long. Okay, so we have like image. 
so we don't need to actually do this. Yeah, okay. So the rent, so this function will call with the image, the screen, on screen rectangle and a depth. That function will call mouse over tile again with the image, but also with the world position, which it just stores with this function. So if these coordinates change, this doesn't change um, the rectangle and the depth. So let's go look at mouse over tile function. I will step through this code in a second just to make it clearer how, how it works. Now, this is like if the screen area contains the mouse coordinates, so mouse.x and mouse.y are where the mouse is currently on the screen, and the depth is smaller than the mouse depth, then it checks, uh, it creates a an offset from it. Um, so where in the rectangle of the image is your coordinates, your mouse coordinates, so it's x minus the left side of the on-screen rectangle, y minus the top side of the on-screen rectangle, and then it gets the pixel data of the image, so it basically just tells the image, return me that one pixel that is at that offset. Then it checks the third, it checks the alpha component, this is just check the alpha component, and if it's fully opaque, that means that your your mouse is over an image, a non-transparent part of an image. Sets the mouse depth and sets the mouse position to that world position. Whew. Also, in a render cycle, before we render anything, we set the mouse position to nothing, and we set the mouse depth to max value. So the way I'm going to explain it. I'm going to have an increasing depth value. So depth zero is um, furthest away. And then as you add more, so depth one is closer, depth two is closer. Because of, of 3D stuff, it's actually reverse. So I have to set the depth to mouse value and then be like, if it's less. So that's the thing. So let's just step through that. So add a breakpoint here. Um, at a breakpoint here and at a breakpoint. That does not work. That does work. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Well, whatever. Oh, I actually don't need that one. So just start. Okay, we set the mouse depth in the mouse position. Oh, we haven't loaded it yet. Okay, now we now we have. No, stop, stop doing that. Okay. So okay. It sets the mouse position to nothing. It sets the mouse depth to a very big number. And then it starts going through everything. Okay, now it's gonna call the render. And we're not stepping over that. And we're not stepping over this. Uh, okay, so now we're in the render function. Now on render is, oh, this looks quite bad, but this is just the function that we gave it. So it draws the thing and it's like, oh, hey, you wanted me to call you when I rendered this thing. So I'm rendering this thing at that position on the screen with that depth, which I just buggered up. That's fine. That is completely fine. Uh, just, just, I need to turn off step, step over things. Okay, now we're in the function that we passed it. This is very complicated. And it's like, okay, just call mouse over tile with this stuff. And now we're here. <sighs> and then it just fails because that's, that's what it does. So that works. And that might not have been entirely clear, which is why the new format is now a thing. So this is a, an animated GIF. I refuse to ch say jif of how the process works. So imagine this is the screen. This is where your mouse cursor is. So this, this blank pixel is where the actual cursor is. 
High means the current highest depth. Of course, in the actual game, it's the lowest depth, but for purposes of explanation, it's easier to do high. Now, it starts drawing stuff. First, it draws this um, tile. Now, the red uh, area is the actual on-screen rectangle. There's a big transparent bit because of the way I'm doing things that isn't being filled, but it's still part of the rectangle. So it checks, is this within this rectangle? Yes, it is. Then it's, it checks, is the current set higher than the highest, which was a question mark. So that's higher. So that's good. Then it checks, okay, is this pixel transparent? Now, this is not a transparent pixel. If the mouse pointer had been here, it would have been transparent. Because it satisfies all of that, it's like, okay, this is the tile that the mouse is over. So it goes on to the next frame. Same thing, on-screen rectangle. Um, obviously, the mouse cursor isn't in a rectangle, so it just goes on. Now, this has a higher Z, because the highest is currently zero, but this rectangle is still not where the mouse is, so that's fine. Oh, now, now we have a rectangle where the mouse is in. So it's like, okay, the set is higher than the highest, okay, but is this a transparent pixel on this image? So ignore everything in the background. It's just about this one tile that it's drawing, not everything that's been drawn before. It's like, okay, that's transparent. So this is not the droid that you are looking for. Then it draws another tile on top of that. Depth is, again, bigger than the one we had, so now that's the highest. The mouse cursor is in the rectangle, and it's not over a transparent pixel in this image. So it sets this as the current um, tile that the mouse is over. Then it does the other tile again, it's not there. This is again, um, it's the same Z, which is an interesting case. You can do it equal or higher or just higher. Um, I think I do do equal or higher, but it's it's kind of finicky. It, it really usually doesn't matter much. But again, it's a transparent pixel, so it doesn't change what the, the mouse is over. And then this one is also gone again. So we wind up with, after everything has been rendered, it's like, okay, this is where the mouse is. So that's convenient. Um, how, do I, how do I make this run again? So this is in motion. Hang on, let me just... Increase the size on that and click this away. So you can see it in motion. Let's just let it go twice because I was doing stuff. So draw a thing. Oh yeah. And then oh yeah, nothing. And then you know where the mouse is. Now you can be like, well, how is this important? Because uh, why does that not open again? Because clearly you've you've drawn this one last, so it should be in front. But I'm just drawing from the back to the front in, in this as an example. In the actual game, it's sorted by a depth buffer. So I could draw this one first and then this one, and this one would still be behind the one I drew first. And in this system, because I used a Z, this algorithm still works because it's like, well, Z zero is lower than Z 1.5, so clearly this one is in front of that one, and the mouse is, in, is over this tile and not the one in the back. If you draw back to front, then you don't need to, hold, to do the whole Z thing, then you can just pick whatever latest thing you drew is that has a non-transparent pixel under the mouse cursor. Whew. I hope that was clear. I do think it was. So what I just do is I, I draw another tile once I know where the mouse is. And um, yeah, now we know where the mouse is and we could theoretically make a system that would let you move. Um, we can't, however, because that is quite complicated. That, because mouse movement is not as easy as you would think. Currently, I could just implement it very naively and it will work. But as soon as there's like obstacles and stuff that you need to work around, that's not going to be a thing that works anymore. 
Um, so I took you to the edge of the world to show you that there are some kind of quirks. Like if I mouse over here, okay, I don't have a mouse position now because my mouse is not over any tiles. But if I mouse over this one, then my mouse is over this tile, which is probably not what we want. You can't actually move there because there is a tile on top, but I haven't made that logic yet. But for now this will do. I can just, you know, when I click somewhere, just go to, to the, you know, the nearest tile that you can actually stand on. So if you want to do mouse movement, you need to do like pathfinding. Which is kind of complicated. In 2D, it's kind of a solved problem using a star algorithm uh, by a Dutch fellow countryman of mine. Unfortunately, you can use that in 3D too, but it's quite a lot more complicated, and I'm gonna have to do that for next week probably. Then, once I've done that, you can click somewhere and it'll move you there, and I can start actually telling the server that we're moving because right now we're just moving the camera in the client the server doesn't know we've budged and then once we've notified the server that we're moving i can actually start making logic where you can have multiple clients and that other clients are notified when one of them moves so everyone can see everyone move then i can add a chat system and then we're basically in mmo territory and then I'll probably try and get a web version out so that people can play it. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not making any promises. Also, if I've never made a 3D A-star pathfinding algorithm, so I may, you know, fail horribly at it and not have an episode at all next week. Anyway, that was DIY MMO. Again, please let me know if you prefer the old format where I'm just rambling while trying to code at the same time, or if you prefer the format where you don't see me coding, but I spend a little bit more time on screen explaining the higher level concepts of how everything works and what I'm doing. Because I think it might be an improvement, but if everyone's like, nah, just keep doing what you were doing, then I guess I'll go back to what I was doing. Anyway. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.